along with Sharon Watkins, we are the host of the Shay Z Author Series. Uh, by day, I'm a real estate agent with Sotheby's, so if you ever need to buy or sell a house, I hope you uh, look me up. Uh, there's some takeaways on the table, some Sotheby's home and uh, art magazine, so if that is interesting to you, please take one home. Um, Today, we have Sam Quinn, which is why the room is very full, and I'm just going to breeze through his bio. Um, for 12 years, he was with Time Magazine, and then he spent 14 years writing for Texas Monthly. Uh, he wrote over 200 magazine stories. He also has written for Outside Magazine, New York Times, Dallas Morning News, Harper's, LA Times, California Magazine, just to name a few. And over his long career, he's received many awards. Um, in addition to writing for those prestigious magazines, he's also been writing books. He's written Selling Money, The Outlaw Bank, uh, the 2010 New York Times bestseller, Empire of the Summer Moon, which was also a, uh, a finalist for the Pulitzer. And in 2015, he wrote the Rebel Yell, which is a 700-pager about Stonewall Jackson. Wow. <laughs> it's a tome. It's a good doorstop. <laughs> and his most recent book is called The Perfect Pass, which I have here. Um, he has a degree in history from Princeton and a master's uh, from John, John Hopkins. Um, usually we talk about the author's most uh, recent work, but I don't want anybody to panic. We're going to spend a lot of time on Empire of the Summer Moon. Because we're Texans and we, we can't, and Sam told me I could talk, ask him whatever I want. So. That's right, but it's always bad, right, when the band says, we're going to try out some new material on you guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> So let's, we're going to just breeze right through, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, The Perfect Pass. This is this book right here, okay. this recent work, right. this little summary. The Perfect Pass. So, so but, uh, one theme that you'll hear tonight like, when I talk about writing is that, is that Texas changed everything for me coming here. I'm not from Texas, I'm a Connecticut Yankee, but I've been here for, I'm like one of those guys who has the bumper sticker, right? I got here as soon as I could, but, which has now been 24 years, but it changed the way I just changed everything and working for Texas Monthly for so long. So one of the things that I, so sometimes, now I, I, I'm mainly focusing a, a, on American history and in a classic traditional sense. So if you see a book like Empire of the Summer Moon, which is, you know, about 17th, 18th, 19th century primarily, or a book about a Rebel Yell, which is a biography of Stonewall Jackson, which is 19th century, those are the areas where I'm normally working. But sometimes you have to go with the best story that you have. So in the, uh, in the fall of 2009, let me back up a little bit. In, in the fall of 2008, this crazy coach at Texas Tech, football coach, <laughs> had this football team that was challenging for the national championship. And there was a very famous game that, that Mike Leach played, the coach of Texas Tech, against for those of you who, who are... Tech people will definitely remember this one, and, 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 and Longhorns will remember it for a different reason. Uh, and that is when Leach beat the number one ranked Texas with their Heisman candidate quarterback Colt McCoy uh, in that extremely remarkable game in November of 2008. So the point was, so I ended up going out to, to Lubbock, so, so Evan Smith, my editor at Texas Monthly, dispatches me the next year, right, to go do the story about Leach, because we're going to put him on a cover in September, right, football season, because Leach is, you know, because he did this great thing. And so I went out there and I had this amazing time, because Leach is just this off-the-wall guy. I mean, you know, you, you, you try to talk about football, and you end up talking about Winston Churchill and Apaches and the offshore breaks in San Onofre, the surf in California. I mean, it's hard to get to football. But he, remarkable guy, but, he, but I asked him at some point, because if you can remember back to those days, dating from the year 2000, Nobody understood how they did this. They didn't have any good players, but they would come in, and even the good players they had they were guys like Wes Welker that nobody ever heard of, or Wanted, or Michael Crabtree, who nobody wanted. But they would come in, and they would put 48 points up on UT, and nobody could, it was the number one offense every single year. Every single year, their quarterback set records. Every single year, they led the nation in offense. It was this fabulous thing, and it was this thing called the air raid. And so I asked Mike, I said, Mike, where, where'd you get this offense from? Where'd you get it from? And he said, uh, he said, well, I gotta tell you a story. 
it goes back to the 1980s in Iowa, a little school called Iowa Wesleyan. Couldn't beat anybody, 400 kids, and and this guy Hal Mummy, the Texan from, of course, they're all Texas. All, all this great passing comes out of Texas, of course. <laughs> and so he told me this story, and I thought, these people changed the American game of football. They did. This passing game now where you see Tom Brady throwing for four, that's, that's <laughs> post-air raid. Hal Mummy changed the game of American football with his little junior assistant, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, Mike Leach. They changed the American game of football. So what a great story. I'm going to tell a story about how these little guys out in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, revolutionized football and were beating teams with, eight, with schools with 18,000 kids and doing this. And I said, that's a great story. So when I finished Rebel Yell, I'd finished Empire of the Summer Moon, I finished Rebel Yell, and I never forgot that story, and I went back to it. And so I wrote that book. It's about reinvention of an American, uh, it's, essentially it's a book about technology. It's about this, these guys that invented something that no one had seen before, sort of a Jobs, Wozniak, Hewlett, Packard, <laughs> but it happened in places like Lubbock and Pleasant, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Anyway. What I found interesting was is the passing game didn't even exist in the 1970s, and just watching the Sunday uh, football games on Sunday, uh, we had a Westlake graduate, an Austinite. I don't know if y'all know that. Does everybody know that? He, yeah, he's from Westlake. His name is Nick Foles. And he uh, led the Eagles to a big win. And I just wondered, all, all day Sunday, I wonder if he knows his own history, how he got there. It would be fun if he'd read his book. I, I might try to get it to him. We have some Foles came out. So what, what happened in Texas, just without boring everybody here, but what happened was, Largely inspired by Mike Leach and the air raid, but in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s, this explosion of passing in Texas, and when they started doing this thing called seven on sevens, which were these summer camps where they got rid of everybody else except the receivers and the quarterbacks, and it was just it was just throwing, 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 throwing. Very deeply influenced by Mike Leach, so so people like Baker Mayfield, people like Mike, uh, people not not so much Breeze, Breeze predates the tradition, but Nick. Baker, they go directly out of that, directly out. So when you go to Westlake and you see their big summer camp this summer, it'll say, Air Raid 7-on-7, seven seven. that's what's going to say. Yeah. So if you're cool. a football fan, this book is very interesting. Yeah, for those of you who are not football yeah. fans, I apologize. <laughs> can everybody hear Sam okay? Is yeah, this Mike okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so... Um, I'm guessing most people in this room are either familiar with or have already read Empire of the Summer Moon. Um, I'm a little obsessed with it, um, I'll have to admit, and uh, Sam gave me permission to, to, I really wanted to do a deep dive, I guess maybe because it's on my fifth generation Texan or just because I love the book so much. So, what, I, where did you get the idea to write about Fauna Parker and the Comanches? It's entirely a product of my moving to Texas. It never would have happened in a billion years without my moving to Texas. Um, uh, I'm, I come from Connecticut. I was working for Time Magazine. I was moving all around. I eventually moved here, and I liked Texas so much that I stayed. Time kept trying to move me elsewhere with ever more tantalizing jobs, you know, in Brussels, and Paris. And but I like Texas too much, so I stayed. And, and, uh, one, of, one, of the things that, one of the things I started to really get interested in was, was Texas history, and there was all this, you know, where I, com where I come from, the frontier, which is, let's say, Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> a, a little bit of Connecticut in there. But where I come from, I mean, there was no frontier. It wasn't in our generational memory. There was no such thing. It didn't exist. No. I mean, I even played summer baseball with Wampanoag Mashpee Indians, and they, they were Indians, but they were the, the I mean, the tribe and, and, and the frontier such as it was, and the Indians such as there were there, were, you know, either killed off by disease bullets or domesticated or they surrendered or something. I mean, hundreds of years before my ancestors got off the boat in Cambridge, so there was no memory of that. I got to Texas, and I'm in a frontier state. I mean, <laughs> and I try to tell people this from an East Coast. I say, you don't get this. You know, you, you, you may want New Jersey to be like Texas, but it is never going to be. <laughs> Partly because Texans, I, and I think I, I've talked about this elsewhere, but I think Texans still live in some sort of mental frontier. But the fact is that, <laughs> and I don't believe that. I, I've written about uh, co covered companies like Whole Foods and Southwest. These were people way out on some mental frontier that nobody else was. Uh, Texas has this in its past. Uh, 
But so I got here, and there was this idea that this frontier was living and alive. First of all, the last of the Comanches were destroyed, and they all went down in the late 19th century, right? Not till then. So I knew people who, who uh, like the woman who worked next door to me at uh, Texas Monthly, you know, her great-grandparents had been killed by Comanches in Austin. I met people whose grandfather, a guy whose grandfather rode with Quana. I mean, you, you guys know this, you, those of you who are multi-generational Texans know this, but there is a very strong generational memory that extends back into the frontier. And there's a feeling, uh, there's just this feeling in Texas, and the more you go, uh, okay. Let's say, for example, that so when I was with Time Magazine, I would travel around, and then I was with Texas Monthly, and I would end up in places like, I don't know, Weatherford, for example, <laughs> Palo Pinto County, Parker County, west of Fort Worth, right? This was the, not only the edge of the frontier, but it was the worst of the frontier. Yeah. I mean, the frontier rolled forward a little bit and then backward, and each time the counties emptied out and hundreds of people were slaughtered, and it was ground zero for the basic confrontation between settlers and Indians in the Southwest period. And you get, I think the first time I encountered it was in a, my favorite book about Texas, which is called Goodbye to a River by John Graves, if any of you know it. And there's this long part about the Comanches in there, and particularly the Martha Sherman Massacre. And I'm going, John Graves is writing about this in the 50s as though it happened yesterday. There's a sense when you have to kind of say, well, when did this happen, actually? Was this, you know, was this the 1920s? For, for that part of the world, uh, well, I guess he, he he was writing about the upper brasses, but he lived at Glen Rose. But for those guys, this was a real this was a real thing. This was real. It was current. It was it was within generational memory, and and as as such, very very significant. And so, so for me, I just heard about Comanches. I heard about Comanches all the time, and then I got interested, and then I started reading. I I won't bore you with all the times people mentioned Comanches, but there I was one night. I was in a little town. This is so typical. I'm up there doing a story. There's a factory that made baseball gloves that burned down. It's in a town called Nokona. <laughs> what does Nokona mean? I don't know. So Nokona, Quanta Parker's father. But uh, the the town Nokona had a had. I did know they made the world's greatest baseball gloves and softball gloves. The factory had burned down. The town was trying to deal with it. Classic journalistic story, right? So I'm up there in the town of Nokona, right? doing this story. And I'm up having a beer with some guys. So just a little bit, we're, we're not far from the Red River. So we go a little bit north. And I think we're in the town of Ringgold, maybe, but near the Red. And this old guy I'm having a beer with starts telling me about this battle that took place. And you know there were French people, and I don't know, Spanish people, and Comanches, and I don't know, on and on and on and on. OK, great, fine. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but what he was describing to me was the Battle of Spanish Ford in 1758, which is the end of Spanish power, literally, in the New World. Or the Spanish came north from Mexico. They thought this place was theirs, right? I'm sorry, it was theirs. Coming north, coming north, coming north, and suddenly they hit something that stopped them. And that thing that they hit was the, first the Apaches and then the Comanches. And it stopped them. That's what, that's, we'll get into this later, but you, you, you try to unlock the history of the American Southwest, why, it, why the West opened as it did, why the history happened as it did. A lot of it is because of Comanches. So the guy was describing the Battle of Spanish Fort, one of these, one of these landmark battles. But anyway, the point is I, I heard all this, and, and I'll, stop, I'll, I'll stop in a moment, but the, one of the characteristics that really struck me about the tales of the Comanches, some of which came from Austin, some of you know them from Austin, um, were that these were never tales about what I would consider the things that you would be interested in Native American culture. Dance, and religion, and mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. and culture, and societal structure, and all of those things, right? Culture. Well, there were stories about that. There were stories about death, and torture, and blood, and destruction that went on and never stopped and people hiding, and people... So what they were telling me, what I was hearing from Texans that was essentially the product of a 40-year war. America never fought, nobody ever fought a 40-year war against any tribe. Texas had to, largely all by itself, with no help from anybody, which is another part of the Texas culture to get into. But that 40-year war, they were essentially telling me what it felt like to be on the other side of this battle that went on for 40 years. It was a war. 
And of course, when you're going to tell stories about a war, you're going to tell stories of blood and death and destruction, because that's what it was. It wasn't stories about the wonderful songs that they sang, although they did sing wonderful songs. <laughs> yeah. But they were an enormously powerful force in the opening of the American Southwest. And I'll shut up. Okay. Uh, I, I get wound up with this. <laughs> I could end up detouring into Rick Perry there, you never know. <laughs> All right, well, we know the Comanches were High Plains Indians and that they were a, a fierce tribe. And Quanah's band, you say, it was the hardiest, uh, the least yielding component of the tribe. And you say, right on the front cover of your book, that they, they were the most powerful tribe in American history. And so I want you to tell us what made them so. Okay, so people have asked, you know, like powerful, does that mean that if like you, if the, if the Comanches fought the Sioux, who would win, you know? <laughs> Which is a really reasonable, reasonable question. And actually there was a, a cable show for a while that did that. It would put like Comanches against the Mongols and see if we win. <laughs> they would do a computer model. Yeah. Comanches did beat the Mongols, by the way. But uh, <laughs> just in case you were doubting my historical... Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> So what I meant by that is is not so much the that 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 micro look at, at that you know that that idea as the ability to influence history. So it's what I was saying before, and in that sense, nobody's even close to these guys. What you see in terms of the history of the Southwest, as I said, they they stopped the Spanish, the northern expansion of the Spanish Empire into uh, what is now you know the United States of America. They stopped the eastward, the westward expansion of the French. French made allies with the wrong tribe. They stopped that, uh, this kind of movement up along the Red River. Uh, they, uh, they determined, they, I mean, they account for you know, the invention of the Texas Rangers. They even account, in a way, for the creation of the Texas state, which, bear with me for a moment, but it, it, it so one of the things that happened was when, when Texas, when Mexico got hold of of, well, what is now Texas, they took over from the Spanish in 1821. So it was now the Mexicans. And so what they did is they had this terrible problem on their northern border. Think San Antonio, think Victoria, think whatever, Laredo. Terrible problem on the border, which was that you had these Indians up there who were some Coman Apaches, and, and, but mostly Comanches, that just made this a terrible place to try to, you couldn't stabilize it, you couldn't, you couldn't deal with the raids up there. And so one way, historically, uh, you know, important way of stabilizing a, an unstable area that you want to control, and you can see this now in, in uh, for example, in the West Bank would be an, a current example of this, but one of the things to do is to settle it, right? I mean, instead of just having, like, a presidio and a mission and a little fort and hovering together and, and being afraid, bring settlers in, bring people in, get civilization in, right? So they decided they were going to give all these head rights free land to these rednecks from, uh, excuse me, settlers from, uh, <laughs> from, from, from <laughs> settlers from, from Tennessee and Alabama, places like that, and they would give these guys, you know, free land. These are the Parkers were, Parkers got enormous amounts of free land. So come on in guys, come on in, settle up, we'll give you the free lands, we'll give you the land grants, come on in. And, uh, and they did. They did by large numbers. They came into, into Texas from elsewhere. And the problem, which was this great scheme, right? Okay, you could, in a cynical way, you could say, well, okay, they're also fresh meat for the Comanches. <laughs> we, we don't have to deal with them anymore. We're going to let those guys deal with them. Well, those guys did deal with them, which accounts for the origin of the Texas Rangers and other things. But it, in fact, their little scheme backfired on them, didn't it? Because those guys that came in, they decided they wanted their independence. <laughs> and then you have Alamo and Goliad and San Jacinto and the foundation of the Texas state. That's not, that's not like straight, you know, linear history exactly, but largely it is true. The Mexicans invited them in and gave them head rights and grants in order to stabilize the border, and they just ended up wanting it themselves. That is essentially the history of the state of Texas. So you could say that on that level it was a misguided scheme to stop Comanches. So, but, but for all those reasons, this, this is why they are powerful, is because they were able to, they nearly committed you know, genocide on the Apaches. It was, uh, they blew the Apaches off the land. They, they created a, a 250,000 square mile integrated empire that was somewhat 
that was kind of the American version of the Roman Empire. The lingua franca that was, was Comanche. The, they, had, uh, they had treaty agreements with tribes like uh, Arapaho and Cheyenne. They had 20 vassal tribes with vassal status. They, uh, and they didn't brook interference with it. And so what you had, so, so the, the reason to be interested in the uh, Kiwanis band, it, Comanches had this interesting band structure that white men never understood. White men always thought there was a president and then the vice president, and then the assistant, <laughs> assistant vice presidents, and then the secretary. Or something. <laughs> there weren't. In, in the Comanche structure, in, in those of you who deal with sort of business management theory, you, you would theory, you'd be seeing an absolutely flat organization. I mean, as flat as it could possibly be. You know, band, 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 band. No head guy. So, you know, the white men would make a treaty with uh. band A, who was, let's say, the Panaticus who were here. And the Kohatis, who were at, uh, let's say Lubbock and Amarillo, they, they didn't have a treaty with anybody. So you had this kind of, uh, this, uh, you know, a very flat, very flat management structure. But even within, even within the individual bands, there was technically a war chief and a civil chief. But anybody like Kwana, enterprising 22-year-old warrior, who could gather 20 or 30 warriors to go raid the youths, mm -hmm. he could do it. So it was even more horizontal than the, just the band structure. But so you had this uh, enormously powerful thing that sits in the middle of the, you know, the reason it's there, by the way. So why is that there? Why is that empire even there? Why is there a Comanche empire there? Well, the reason is is they uh, they were the tribe that that under. They got a hold of the Spanish horses and they understood them better than anybody else did and they used the new technology to dominate the Great Plains. They were the great, the, the entire balance of power tipped on the plains because of their mastery of the horse. And then once they had the horse, they were this kind of tribe that had been relegated to the kind of bad hunting grounds of the Wind River Mountains. They moved south with the horse, invincible, nobody could stop them. They moved south. Why are they moving south? Why are they moving toward Amarillo, you might ask? <clears throat> <laughs> because that restaurant is that is not there yet. Where you get the, first step, the 72 ounces that you can eat it, that's not there yet. Uh, why are they moving south? They're, they're, they are the, the, the great new power in the continent is moving south to challenge for what you'd think they would challenge for, which is the greatest food source in the continent, which is the buffalo herds. Well, there were buffalo in Montana and Wyoming and stuff, but nowhere near the numbers that they were in the Southern Plains. And if you want to think of Southern Plains, we're going to think about, you know, Western Oklahoma, Western Texas, West Texas, uh, Eastern uh, Colorado, Eastern New Mexico. These are the Southern Plains. So they, they came south to challenge for that. And that's why we as Texans encountered them when we did. Okay, so that's about the Comanches. Tell us sort of the Talk about Juana. Yep. One uh, incredibly interesting guy. One of the most uh, fascinating people of his era, uh, certainly one of the most prominent people of his era. Juana came up, I guess unfortunately for him in some ways, and perhaps some ways fortunately, it's hard to tell what, but I mean he came, he came of age just at the end. Uh, and by the end I mean, so by 18... By the 1870s, what was happening was the, by policy, the U.S. government was allowing buffalo hunters to kill buffalo, effectively to kill off all the buffalo. They knew they were, too. They knew they were because of what the, the prices of buffalo hides had moved in New York to such an extent where, to, where people, in, for economic purposes and reasons, people would kill as many buffalo as they could and ship them east because you could make money at it. So there was no end to it unless somebody stopped it. And so people who could have stopped it, like as Phil Sheridan, the general in charge at that point, said, if you take their commissary away, we take the commissary, we drew destroy them. And so here you have a, a tribe, the uh, Comanche, uh, well, like all Plains Indians, that got everything from the buffalo. I mean everything. Food, lodging, weapons, tools, uh, clothing, everything comes from the buffalo. And you take the buffalo away and there is no, and there, 
there are no Plains Indians. There's no such thing as a Plains Indian that's going to farm, and they never did, and they wouldn't. And even when they were given farmland, they would sublet it, sub it to white people to do it. They wouldn't do it. And so Quana had the misfortune to come of age just as, I think he was 23 when my book opens in the 1870s, 23. So he's in his early 20s when things really go down. Uh, he was a, uh, from all accounts, one of the greatest warriors of his age. He grew up in a, pretty, a particularly brutal time, and he didn't talk about that. Um, so there were, there were raids, for example, into the Texas Hill Country, the Fredericksburg area, Legion Valley area of that era that were some of the absolute bloodiest that we, we, would, we would consider um, very bad in terms of who they killed and how they killed them. Kwana was probably on them. Uh, this was just part of the culture, but uh, interestingly, when, so at the very end, he's the last holdout, he's the last of the last of the Southern in Plains Indians. He's out, they're out by Lubbock and they're hiding and of course no one can find them. They've been trying, U.S. Army's been trying for a long time to find them, they can't find them. But Quana at some point they're reduced, you know, eating, eating prairie dogs and stuff and they've been, and, uh, things that they didn't normally eat. He drags them in sort of starving to death, you know, 1875 to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, and then you have this kind of launch of this remarkable second career. He becomes the, the most prominent Native American of the, of the reservation period. He, uh, he there's, a, there's a, if they ever make a movie out of it, which they're working on, if they ever do, there's this, uh, the, the, this, this great screenplay that they wrote. But I mean, there's a there's scene in the screenplay where Quan arrives at Fort Sill. Uh, sometimes fiction can do what, what I can't do, but and so what happens is he goes to the commander, Randall Slidell McKenzie, and, and they meet. But just so to clear, this is after they have given up, they've been they've driven given up, up and they've, they've all driven they've dragged the themselves in. And everybody knows Quana Parker and his mother, Cynthia Ann Parker. Right. Okay, all right. Just uh, I, I, probably, sure. I possibly should have mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Cynthia Ann Parker. The whole thing starts with the kidnapping yeah. of Cynthia Ann Parker. And, uh, okay, well, well, let's get to that later. I'll just I'll finish this story. But yes, he's the he's the the, the Comanche Wars start with the kidnap, kidnapping of <coughs> Cynthia Ann Parker and end conveniently for my book with uh, with uh, Quanah's surrender. But Quanah comes in and the first thing he says is to Mackenzie, the commander at Fort Sill, surrendered to with his miserable starving Indians. He says, I want to tell you who I am, who my mother is. And he says, um, my mother is Cynthia Ann Parker. And you know. Mackenzie, after he picks his jaw up off the ground, because nobody even knew, I mean, everybody, no, no idea. Plus, she'd been dead for a long time. Yeah. So she was the most famous captive of her era, right? The white squaw who shocked everybody, but she wouldn't return, right? Everybody knew Cynthia Ann Parker. Everybody knew Cynthia Ann Parker. And, and she had a son. And he was becoming the last and greatest chief of the Comanches. Well, nobody knew that until Quana walks into Mackenzie's office and goes, hey, by the way, and, and he says, you know, this is my mother, and I want to find her. And you have this remarkable moment where then Mackenzie, the American the Army commander, uh, helps Quana try to find his mother. It's really very touching. And they fail. They fail for a long time. They can't. Nobody's cooperating because okay, Cynthia is actually dead and her bones are in East And does Texas. he speak English at this point? Can he speak English? Or is it's it's a little that? hard to tell. There were, there were translators at Fort Sill. Um, it seems that he spoke Spanish, which would make more sense. He yeah. spent a lot of time writing in Mexico. Um, he certainly would have had some English, although the Quahatis, because one of the reasons that the Quahatis had survived, this was his band, that they had survived kind of unpolluted for so long, is that they were... They held themselves aloof out in the Panhandle. Their winter camps were Paladero Canyon. That's where they hung out. Enormous Bermuda horses, gigantic numbers of like 1.15 thousand horses. I think they had. And they, unlike the, the Comanches that were local here, who eventually got destroyed by the culture. I mean, at some point they couldn't cook without pans because the white people gave them pans, and they would trade. You know, I mean, it's hard not to get polluted by the other culture. Guajatis didn't get polluted. Because one of the reasons, that, and, and not only, they didn't get polluted, and they didn't get killed off by the diseases, because that's the other thing that happens when you come in with the white, close to the white culture. They had this because they held themselves aloof. They had this. They used these intermediaries between. Just, a, I mean, they were not only in the Paladero Canyon. Just imagine they were in Paladero. Okay, they're camping there, and they want some goods of some kind, whatever they might be: rifles, gunpowder. Uh, whatever they might be, clothing. 
blankets, whatever they might be, to trade one way or the other, or to sell cattle, uh, to, to either sell or buy. They had these intermediaries that were known as comancheros. And the comancheros were, in other words, they went back and forth between Santa Fe. And so there wasn't that, that constant jostling as there was here between civilization and San Antonio and Fredericksburg and Austin and, and settlements and, 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 and Indians, which eventually destroyed them. So, um, so Quano was, the, was in that kind of that, that relatively pure group, um, the last of them there. So, um, let's, let's talk a little more. You mentioned about horses and Comanches, but to me, this is the part I just, I just, I'm just job dropping information that I never knew. So, tell us a little more about, you know. How, how they got them, how they mastered them, and give us some examples of their horsemanship. And I also want to know if you used uh, J. Frank Dobie's uh, 1952 book, Mustangs, in your Absolutely. research. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I used J. Frank. Yes, I did. Uh, horses were, were the foundation of their power. So here's the story of horses. So the Spanish come over here, you know, Columbus discovers America, right? Even though there were people who had apparently already discovered it since they were living here. But uh, Columbus discovers it, and uh, they, and the Spanish uh, colonize Mexico first, and then they come north. Now, there's, there were no horses on this side of the pond. There weren't any, period. I mean, we all may think of, you know, Indians on horseback, but no one who came, who when the, when the pilgrims were, or the Jamestown colonists, there was no Indians on horses. There weren't horses. Um, and, uh, and so the first horses arrived with the Spanish. And now the Spanish have a very elaborate technological understanding of horses. First of all, they have these great these horses that have these, this stock that comes out of Central Asia through Arabia and Northern Africa. They're these remarkable creatures that are actually uh, well adapted to Andalusian Peninsula and that, that area, but they turned out to be extremely well adapted to the Southwest and Mexico. And so now the Spanish have these horses and they have a lot of them. And they, and they understand on some level that this is a technology that could be dangerous and they get that. They're not stupid. And so they're, they, they try to control it. In other words, they try to only let the native Americans, in this case, Native Americans who were living in Mexico, the tribes in Mexico, they, to try to control their access to it. Mm -hmm. But they fail in the long run. They can't really, can't really control it. Um, so now the Spanish are coming north. Coming north, and they're coming north with horses. And uh, at some point, they cross the border. They come into what is now New Mexico. They set up their big colony, which is in Santa Fe, right? There's another colony in San Antonio, big colony in Santa Fe, the center of it all. And they have these horses. And at some point, the two things, well, a couple things happen. One, the technology gets out. That elaborate Spanish understanding of the horse, which is saddle, which is, you know, you, how you bridle, breed, break, hunt with, fight with every, issue, every single thing that they do. Uh, uh, capture, well, including capturing them in the wild, but they, they, this understanding of the horse at some point passes to Indians. The first tribe to take advantage of it are the Apaches, not the Comanches, interestingly enough. The Apaches, though, from all that we know, don't go very far with it. They go just so far with the horse. Partly because they were, they still like to plant corns and beans and corn and beans and squash. So they, they never quite got rid of the old sedentary agrarian, which is what all the Indians were. Or, well, there, there were nomadic hunter gatherers and there were agrarian or agricultural Indians, but they never quite got rid of it. The Comanches, however, fully got it, and they got it. And somehow, talk about technology transfer. The thing about it is, is no one. I mean, the Comanches saw it, but no one in a position to record it or write it down can see it. It's happening in the 1600s, this transfer to the Comanches. By the end of the 17th century, by the end of the 1600s, the transfer is so complete that something starts happening. The Spanish, because the Comanches got the horse first, they just drove the Spanish crazy with their brutal raids against Spanish settlements all along the Rio Grande River. This Using is their technology. 
Yeah, of course. Using it against them. <laughs> well, because they would raid and then they'd ride away and you couldn't catch them. So it was pretty, so, so this intractable problem, they didn't know what to do about it, they, they had trouble, they couldn't deal with it. Then something interesting starts happening. Sometime in the late 1600s, there's something, you know, the Spanish who were, who were terrible administrators in many ways, and they did a lot of things wrong, but one, they, they recorded things, they, they, you know, when the Comanches first rode into the plaza in, in Santa Fe, they said, hmm, who are those guys? They noted it down, asked who they were, who are they? Comanzia? Okay, wrote it down. The Spanish started to see their enemies going away, and they went, hmm, what's going on? The Comanches, they're, they're going away, they, they're not bothering us anymore, or they couldn't figure it out. And at some point, they do figure it out. And what's happening is a virtual genocide is being committed on them by the Comanches. And indeed, their enemies are going away. And by the time Geronimo you know, bursts on the American scene, the Comanches have been relegated to the borderlands from a very large area that the Comanches then took from them. Um, but uh, so, so you have this kind of this moment where part of what contributes to this is in 1680, there was a Pueblo revolt in Santa Fe. This is actually very important in the history of the horse. It, there was a, a Pueblo revolt in Santa Fe, and a lot of horses got out. And one of the things that happened was the Pueblos drove the Spanish literally clear out of what is now the United States of America back into Mexico. Indians re, <coughs> retook Santa Fe. Now, the Spanish came back, but in the meantime, I'm not quite sure how many horses got out, 20,000? These were, these were Mustangs that did really well in the Southwest, and they got out. It was a great horse dispersal, and they came into the hands of the Plains Indians. And the Plains Indians that knew what to do with, uh, as I say in my book, there was something in the soul of a Comanche that knew about horses better than anything. And, and it was interesting because all the descriptions of Comanches physically were... Uh, you would contrast them with, say, the Indians of the Northern Plains, the so Sioux, for example. Sioux were tall, kind of chiseled features, athletic looking, you know. Comanches were short, squatty, and, and they were kind of ungainly. Except... Well, no, no, except when they got on a horse. Oh, yes, well, like Kwani. Yes, Kwani, because Kwani was half white, but more Germanic in some ways. Right. But the, uh, the, except when they got on the horse. And they were just this thing happened, this astounding thing. They they could fight better, hunt better, ride better, do everything better, steal horses better. They would this one George Catlin <coughs> describes watching this Comanche, you know, they would take these horses and they would just ride them until they were base they would they would ride them until they were virtually dead. They would force them to keep going without water until they were basically about to die. This was, a, oh, I'm sorry, a wild Mustang at this point. One of those horses that got out. They wanted to break the horse. So they take the horse, they run it nearly to death, to the point where it's um, either on the ground or about. And then this description, it's in my book, but you go, this guy comes over, puts the hands on the horse, takes his muzzle, blows into his nostrils. And the description is the horse gets up, it sort of walks away with the Indian. Mm -hmm. Anyway, read, you, have to, you have to get my book to read that. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, no, but it's, it's, there were things like this. There was this, this elaborate understanding of, of, of the horse. And uh, uh, as I say, nobody, nobody, nobody recorded it happening, so we don't know exactly how it happened. But we know what happened on the other end of it. In fact, it was the Comanches who... So the Plains Indians are famous to us because they got a hold of these horses, right? And so, the, and the way most of them got them was through the intermediary of Comanches. And so, there are tribes that we know, uh, Plains tribes, because they got good with the horse. Sioux, you will recognize these names, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Blackfoot, Kiowa, right? We know these names. These were the horse Indians. The first horse Indians. There weren't any Apache. There, there weren't horse Indians before them. Um, and so, horse plays a, a, a huge role, and it, and it mainly, it plays a role primarily in the days, in the days kind of before the collision with the white man, which happens in Texas in the 1830s. Got to watch out what questions you ask, because you get like 20 minute answers. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what we're all here for, is the answers, right? <laughs> okay, so, Jim, you know, it's another bit of, technology 
that does the um, that turns kind of the tide uh, to the end of the Comanches. You know, the Spanish couldn't conquer them, the Texas Rangers couldn't. And so, tell us a little bit about the end and the roundup. You know, it took the um, after the Civil War the U.S. Cavalry to come out yep. and the, the new technology of the repeating rifle, or, or would they ever have conquered? the community. So tell us a little bit about the end. The end. The end is really interesting. So one of the things that happens is the Comanche, one of the reasons there was a 40-year war and maybe not a 25-year war was because when the Civil War happened, it basically took away what passed for federal authority in this area. And I mean, once, and of course, once, once secession happened, it was two kinds of federal authority. There was Union and Confederate federal authority. And essentially, all of the tension went elsewhere, as in t to the war right, itself. Right. And so, what was left out here to police the Indians were the with these, you know, these drunken militias. These that was like the lowest of the, the guys that you didn't want, right? Those guys. And uh, so, one of the things that happened is you you had this uh, during the early. So the Civil War starts in 1861, ends in 1865. During those years, this. All hell breaks loose out here in Texas, in Oklahoma, Indian Territory. One of the things that had happened was, starting in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson had started to move Indians to Oklahoma. That's what Indian you know, Oklahoma is, was, was Indian Territory, moved them all there. One of the things that the evaporation of all federal authority from the area meant was that the horse tribes, like the Comanches, just, just, uh, you know, raided and, and went after these nice, you know, agrarian tribes like the Chickasaws and the Choctaws and the Cherokees and so forth and the Seminoles and the, who, who, were, uh, who, who were in Oklahoma at that time. So you had this kind of Indian civil war that goes on, you know, this Indian war going on there. You have this complete evaporation. So what it does is it gives the Comanches, uh, who were the dominant power, a new lease on life. There's no, there's no power to stop them here. Okay, now fast forward. Okay, let's say, let's, let's go to 1871 now. Because 1871, this war against the Comanches has been going since 1835 or 1836. Uh, you know, the, when you look at the people who are running America in 1871, it's very interesting because they, they relate very closely to the Civil War. So the president is a guy named Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, his main, the, the general in charge of the armies is William Tecumseh Sherman. And his lieutenant in charge of the armies of the West, I guess it was the Department of Missouri, was Phil Sheridan. These are the warriors who destroyed the South. These are the boys who did it. And when you look at the kind of firepower that was unleashed at a Pick your battle. I don't know the battle of the, the, the Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, anything else. The, the world had never seen this this level of firepower, particularly with the artillery that went off. And when you look at the world in 1971 out here, Ulysses S. Grant looks at this world and he goes, "You know, it's amazing, but we are the guys who, you know, fought a war where 750,000 people were killed, and you know, uh, one of the bloodiest wars in American history." And yet there's a tribe out here with 25,000 members that is holding up the entire advance of Western civilization. That's true. Now, I don't know what 25,000 says to you, but to me it says like the third baseline at the ballpark at Arlington. It's about right, right? Or roughly? Or one quarter of Jerry World? It's not that many. And of those 25,000, we're talking 5,000 warriors. So by this point, and that's how many there are left at this point because of the disease, and so in, in 1871, there's this great moment. And this is the beginning of the end. So Ulysses S. Grant takes his, his favorite Civil War officer, Randall McKenzie, and with 600 mounted blue coats operating out of Fort Richardson and Fort Concho, he says, go get those guys, end this. Just end, come on, really. Right? I mean, 5,000 guys holding up. The, the, the federal government, not that the army was that big by this point, it wasn't, but still, it, it's, there's, they're relatively small numbers. So, Mackenzie takes off, right? He's got 20 Tonkawa scouts, 600 mounted blue coats, and they're going to go get, and their target is a place called Blanco Canyon, which is just east of Lubbock. 
it's not a very spectacular canyon, it's just kind of a canyon, but uh, there's a little stream that flows through it. But camped there is this 23-year-old war chief named Quan. Nobody has any idea that his name is Quan Park. His name's Quan. And he's in a he's in a place with there's a there's a he's got 200 lodges. And uh, and because so the Tonkawa scouts now the thing one of the things you have to understand about the U.S. Army is that they never found the army never found any Indians not even a single Indian yeah. they, they, they they were unable to find Indians okay if you want to, so so this like it's like the Dudley Do right right riding out you know to find nothing and they're riding back but if you employ Tonkawas or you know or a scout you you could find Indians so they had their Tonkawa scouts so. There's this amazing kind of, it's this confrontation, it's the beginning of the end, but it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, one of the first things, of course, that, you know, Mackenzie rides into the camp in Blanco Canyon, one of the first things that Quanta does is what the Comanches always did to the stupid white people, they sold their horses, like the first thing, and the white people go, wait a second, okay, and then they realize, wait, what it means to not have a horse out there, <laughs> it means you're basically dead, uh, and uh, it was the first thing they ever did, it was like, you know, and the first thing you had, you got to learn, wait, take care of the horses. <laughs> it's like, you, you know, whatever. But uh, you have to you need a mnemonic device to do that. But so, so what happens is, so, so you have, so, so they finally, I don't know, somehow they recover from all Kwanis stampeding the horses. And now they, they know where they are. They're in Blanco Canyon. How hard can this be? There's, so, so Kwana is a, is a war chief, but he's, he's in charge of a village. And it's got 200 lodges. So think of a lodge as a teepee, right? And, uh, and so at a lodge, in, in, a, in a camp like that, there are only a certain number of warriors. There's a lot of women and children, old men, cows, horses, stuff, you know, stacks of hides and food. So the uh, Tonkawa scouts ride in front up the valley in pursuit of the village, right, to go presumably slaughter the village or whatever they were going to do. And they get to the village, the village is gone. Now what's really interesting is that when you're when you're tracking a village, when you're pursuing a village, which is very different than just pursuing a bunch of guys on horses, right? So one of the things that that a, that a village, so those those lodges I told you about, right? They're constructed of poles. That's how the teepees are constructed. So hide is then wrapped around poles, right? So that when you move the village, you have to. What they do is they didn't have wheels, so they used the horse travoy. And a horse travoy was something so two behind the horse you had two straight, perfectly straight lodge poles, right? And then the goods laid, the buffalo hides and the whatever they had laid on the food, laid on top of that. That is how a village moved. So that when a village moved in the desert, an interesting thing happened, of course. It creates parallel lines in the desert. Right? I mean just lots of them. You would think that would be incredibly easy to track. <laughs> so they move forward, and, and there's the descriptions of this. They got okay. This is this is going to be very easy, right? We got you know we can just see the lodge pole. At some point, the Tonkawa scouts become twenty. I don't know how many miles, a bunch of miles, 10, 15 miles, ten miles. The uh, the Tonkawas become very confused. Suddenly, they become confused, and suddenly it's clear that they have no idea where the where the village is, where it went. And what, what happened was is suddenly that those parallel lines started to go wildly crisscrossing all over the place. And then the village disappears. And then, uh, I'm not making this up, and, and then they realize, this is the first chapter in my book, but the, uh, th then they realize that then at some point as night is falling, they realize one of the scouts has found the village. The village is now behind them. <laughs> So, I mean, imagine, I mean, you have to think, I mean, this is Quanta now, this is a, a commander who, I mean, imagine taking the field against your enemy with the village on your back. That's what he's doing. And so he, so, anyway, so they, they, they bivouac for the night, okay, we're going to go get these guys in the morning. We know where they are now, they're behind us, okay? So they take off and they go behind them. They track them again, this time they disappear again. This time they, they disappear up a 500-foot canyon wall. If you guys know what the cap rock is out in, out there, okay, the cap rock is where the dead flat, like billiard table plains, the, say between Amarillo and Lubbock, and Lubbock, go into the more rolling plains below, and it's anywhere between a 200 and 1,000 foot drop down. These guys go up the cap rock, 
and now they're gone again. And, and so the, the, the blue coats mount up, and climb the cap rock, pursue them again. They disappear again. They go down the cap rock. There is yet a third iteration of this where they go and they end up disappearing and then going up the cap rock again. But, the, okay, but at some point, this becomes untenable. So now, now the blue coats mount the cap rock again, and now they got them. They see them. They're there. They're, they're fleeing into the, think of the cotton fields you know, around Lubbock. They're fleeing. Out, okay, there's no Lubbock and there's no cotton fields, but they're, they're fleeing out there. And then, and so it's like you can just see them going, okay, <clears throat> all right, we're going to get these guys. And then, like, on cue, either from God or Cecil B. DeMille, <laughs> right at that very moment comes a blue, a, a, a howling blue norther. And I mean a howling blue norther. And for those of you Texas, Texas know what norther is. Uh, norther is where it is. It happens in the fall. Temperatures drop 50 degrees in a half an hour, an hour. A blue norther adds ice and snow to it. It was what, it was what the cowboys... Larry McMurtry has some wonderful descriptions of what it feels like to be driving cattle in a blue norther. And so Mackenzie and his guys are all, because the day started out, this beautiful, it was a beautiful West Texas 72 degree, and they're all wearing their light uniforms, right? And this, this ice and snow, and then 40, 50 mile an hour winds come down. And there's this moment, the great moment that I says, says a lot, that I think says a lot about Quana, and was that, so Mackenzie has to make this decision. Is he going to soldier on into the teeth of the 50 mile an hour blizzard, you know? Or is he going to camp and just try to survive it? And, but he, so he decides and he makes a decision that he, that he never regretted, but, but to camp, stop. And so the last sight is literally into, this, in, into the howling blizzard, the, the village getting away. And so the lesson was the great lesson of planes warfare, which was escape. Attack was important. <laughs> Escape was equally important because any Comanche that ever raided a Ute, there would be immediate counter raid. Not, not we were going to think about this for a couple of weeks. It was immediate. The pursuit, you went in and you took their horses and their women, and then they pursued you. There was no like tomorrow. It was right away. So you had to learn how to escape, and you had to do it really quickly. And the art of escape was very important. And one of the things that Quana taught Mackenzie, and he taught it really well, Quana schooled Mackenzie in how to fight on the plains. And four years later, Mackenzie came back with his acquired war technology, and that was the that was the Red River War, the the end of um, of the free Indians on the Southern Plains. Um, but it was one of these uh, again. I guess you call it. It was it was a it was the reverse technology transfer. I guess in some ways. Well, um, I have like a hundred more questions, but we're running out of time, and I want to be sure we give I give time for everybody. For we have some time for the audience to ask questions. So I. I wanted to ask you, you know, this book became a sensation. I mean, it resonated with people. It's extremely well written. Um, were you surprised by success? And, and why did you think it was so successful? I was surprised by its success, and I think everybody was. Um, the first printing was supposed to be 7,000, which gives you, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> gives you an idea of what the publisher thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, but I don't know, I don't think there was any anticipation of that at all. You know, and I, I, I saw this as, it was, a, it was a project of passion on my part. I was working at Texas Monthly, I mean, I was working on it, you know, sitting out there watching my daughter play softball in Dripping Springs and you know, working on it in the car. I mean, it was like that. And. Uh, I really wanted to do it. I didn't get a huge advance on it. I just did it, and so I wanted to do it. Um, but I do, I do know why it works, and I wouldn't have known this maybe then. I, would, my, I wouldn't have known that what I had done worked so well. But there was it was accidental in some ways. But so in my book, you have you have this great story that I've tried to tell you a little bit about, which is the great arc of the rise and fall of the Comanches as a tribe. It's very dramatic. It's very, it's defining of the entire southwest of the United States. It's great. It's this huge arc of rise and fall. There's tragedy at the end and exhilaration with the, you know, with the, with the excess of the horsepower and then the tragedy of the end of the buffalo. It's just a great story. And all by itself, it would have been a good story. But I had this other thing sitting there. This little nine-year-old girl who got taken in 1836. Mm -hmm. 
with corn flower with blue eyes and blonde hair from her parents' camp, you know, 90 miles south of Dallas. And so what I had is a story of her family. Not only the family that she was taken from, but the family that she built, how she was recaptured, and the whole saga of Cynthia Ann. So, so when I, so I started, so what I decided to do was to, and, you, and if you look at the structure of the book, this is what it is, I decided to alternate chapters. So you get one, which is the arc of rise and fall, the James Michener-esque, whatever, you know, thing, and then the little story of the family. And then the big arc of the rise of all, and then the little story of the family. So you're never very far from that little girl. And then, and the, when this happened while I was writing the book, I, this I did understand. I, I, I'm doing this alternate, it was like, it's the big picture, small picture, big picture, small picture. This is working. And my editor thinks it's working. And then I get to Kwana, and damn if the tracks don't run together. <laughs> it all comes together. It was a natural, I said, oh. I don't have to, this isn't alternating anymore. Kwana, the great arc of the rise and fall, is now the story of the family. They're the same story. They're identical. So that's why it works. Because it, it is, either book would have been okay. The little book about Cynthia, and there's someone who did write it, a very good book about that, uh, Frontier Blood, I think. Uh, or you write the big picture. Either one would have been okay. Together, you're never, as a reader, very far from the human story. And I always try to remember, remind myself that when I write, is try to, you know, don't get too far away from a person. So, but anyway, well, that's... Well, and it, it did resonate. It resonated with, um, it, you know, obviously, it stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for many, many weeks. And I have a friend who's here. <laughs> you know, I, I talked about it ad nauseum, and I have a friend here whose husband talked about it as nauseum, and she finally had to tell her husband, you cannot mention the word Comanche. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the greatest compliment, one of the greatest compliments anybody paid me is that she, a woman came up to me and at some point at, at a book signing and she said, you know what you've written? She says, she said, you're in the Hey Honey book. And I said, oh, okay, uh -huh. well, thank you. So what, what does that mean? And she goes, well, I'm reading it. And I go, hey, honey. <laughs> And the, and the reason it is is because I am a Connecticut Yankee who did not know any um, of this. So it is my. I, so if if it seems like I'm really excited to discover yeah. all this wonderful stuff, it is. So it was a hey honey, like I was like hey Sam. <laughs> I, I I had to discover so to a, a character like Jack Hayes, the invention of the six shooter. I I mean you can't make it up. It's too it's too incredible. And so uh, all that was entirely news to me. Well, um, I could keep going and going with questions, but I would like to uh, open it up so that the audience has a chance to ask questions. We have some questions from the audience. Yes. Okay, okay Lord, here. Teal's going to bring you the microphone. Well, I'll use my outside voice to say. <laughs> I had grandmother who was Comanche and shared all these stories with me, but more importantly, you should never discuss Mike Leach, Sam, without discussing his affection for pirates. Oh, yeah, I know. Well, a lot of historians claim that one reason we Anglos were finally able to control the Southwest, and particularly Texas, was the ability of the Comanches, not only with their horsemanship, but they learned how to shoot off the horses, and the yeah. Spanish never did with all their powerful they Is there something to that? Absolutely. So one of the interesting things about, so, so uh, I, I'm, I'm having a, a junior moment, or maybe it's now, by now it's a senior moment, I guess, but uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. So, so there was, when the, the white men first saw the Comanche, they literally could not believe what they were looking at. <clears throat> the, their ability to shoot, while moving on a horse, their ability to shoot under the horse's neck, their ability to, I mean, it was this incredible stuff that nobody had ever seen before. And it changed everything. Yeah, the Spanish absolutely could not do that. And <clears throat> so one of the things that they, they would describe, the number of arrows, that this is from the 1830s now, descriptions saying, uh, they would say, seriously guys, seriously, these guys can shoot arrows like this, and from under the horse's neck, and stuff like that. And, and, and these were reliable, these were, you know, Dodge and Catlin and reliable people. <clears throat> and even when I was writing the book, I remember thinking, 
uh, I remember thinking, yeah, it's hard to believe that they could have done it. So anyway, interestingly, a few years ago, a guy, and, and if you want to Google this, I, I'm blanking on his name now. I usually have his name. But anyway, this guy, he's a, he's a trick shooter. Now, what happened? The, the Lars Anderson. Yeah, Lars Anderson. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Lars Anderson. So, so basically, it, so over the years in the 19th century and in the 20th century, trick riders in shows would would do these things. They would do uh, under the they, there was a leather thong over the side of the horse, and you'd hang down, you'd shoot. People did those things, but this guy, but nobody ever explained the full understanding. So what Lars Anderson did was. If you look at the video on Google, and really seriously Google it, it will change your understanding of everything. Is For one thing, he said, nobody ever used a quiver. There aren't any quivers being used here. You, you, they're, they're, being, they're either like this or they're put in the ground, but mainly like this. And you watch him shoot. That's the frequency of shots. And I, I don't think I'm, I'm not exaggerating, but you, you see for yourself. But what he said was, his premise was that that... The great archers of all time, like the Comanches, never, there was never a one-eye closed shot from a standing position. And in fact, when the white people asked them to do it, and I put this in my book too, when the white people asked them to do it, they say, okay, now we're going to set up a thing here, and you hit it, okay? And the Comanche would give it to him, and he couldn't hit it. And they didn't get why. Because they had this idea that you would just line up and, and fight for a standing position. And Lars Anderson and these guys, these people have proven, they never shot from a standing. They never met, they never shot when they weren't moving. They were jumping, they were riding, they were, they were, it was constant, it was always movement. It was, what was the thing in, uh, remember the opening of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Remember? Where they ask him, and, and they say, you try to shoot that, and he misses it, and then he ends up, mo he, he moves and he hits it dead on, and he says, I'm better when I move. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the video that you'll see on YouTube, the Lars Anderson video, will show you what, this, what these guys could do. And, it, and what it did was it, and I had not seen it at the time that I wrote my book, but it's absolute proof of everything. It, it, it is possible, and, and uh, it does suggest that this is, that this is what happened. But uh, uh, anyway, yeah, it changed everything. And, and, and I think that what happened was that, that the ability to do that mounted, specifically mounted, was something that nobody had ever done before. The Spanish didn't fight mounted. You know, the, the, a dragoon was something that you you you, you got a, a, in this in the Spanish case a heavily mounted guy who got on the horse, rode to the place, got off the horse, and fought. It was not a mounted cavalry. It was not a fighting cavalry. In fact, dragoons explained you know most of what the American cavalry even in the West was, or much of it was dragoons, not strictly cavalry. So what these guys did is they figured out this way they would fight on horseback and they would fight with constant movement no matter what they were doing under the thing or, or, or galloping away or galloping toward. And so one of the interesting, one of the things that Jack Hayes and the Rangers did in, in San Antonio in the 1830s and 1840s was they copied this ability to fight from the sap, uh, which was the key to Comanche warfare. And the first time that technology ever got out and, and ever got into the public eye was when those rangers took it to Mexico and, and just flat amazed everybody because they were these big guys on horses that just never left the horse and would kill you from the horse. And there was no such thing in America at that point. Mm -hmm. Another question back yes, here? Yes, ma'am. How long did it take you to write the book? Yeah. Oh. I guess it's hard for me to remember. I mean, probably about three years. Okay. Uh, I guess about three. So it involved going, you know, I, I obviously went to all the places, and I, you know, which was fun, and I, which some of which I've been to, but going to, uh, going to archives in Oklahoma and West Texas, and uh, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, if I hadn't lived in Austin, I would have had to move here to do the book, because the Briscoe Library here is ground zero for, for Comanche. Were you able to interview any of those descendants, and how old were they? The, the, the descendants, aren't much help if you're a historian. Uh, they're, I've met lots of descendants. I mean, go to my website, you'll see a picture of me with Kwana's granddaughter, but uh, who looks just like it, weirdly enough. But uh, they're, uh, yeah, as a historian, what you want to do is you want to, uh, in my case, what I wanted to do was less an oral tradition. The tribe will give you its version of what happened, which is their own version, which is, 
that's fine, and I respect that version, but it's not the documented version. So I, what I went for was documentation. So when there were Comanche documents, like Baldwin Parker's great biography of Quan, I would use that. But the book essentially is based, uh, the whole, our whole understanding of Comanche culture is based on interview with Comanches. It's just that the ones I used were done in the 20s and 30s with people who remember the, the, and there was actually quite a bit of that. And there was some done in two different projects so you were talking to people who remembered the days, uh, but uh, well, I, mean, I met a bunch of Comanches anyway. But they're, they're, it's an interesting, it's an interesting group. They still seem sort of bumptious the way they, you know, they're still kind of rowdy. <laughs> got, got, a, got a couple more questions. We can do maybe two more. Uh, somebody. Okay. I would like to ask you, what years do you think that the American Indian? were no longer in such force that, that Americans would start moving around more. 1870s, what? Yeah, uh, well, let's talk about Texas. Um, yeah. Until 1875, you, uh, wow. West Texas was, was not a play for, for you as a settler. You couldn't, it, it couldn't, you couldn't do it. Uh, so it was, it was, it was all, it was Comanche dominated. Now, the settlements, I think, were as far as, say, Wichita Falls, maybe, but they weren't farther than that. There was really nothing north of that. I mean, it was the settlement, the wave of U.S. settlement that hit the Indian frontier happened in Texas. It swept down this way like that. It didn't go north. It didn't go north until later. But uh, the, I would have said that, so, so there was this incredible moment in American history when uh, the Southern Plains Indians surrender in the Panhandle in 1875. That's Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Comanches. That's 1875, okay? Literally within the year, Charles Goodnight has got cattle running in Palo Duro Canyon. And it's the beginning of this entirely different world of the cattlemen. There was nothing happening in those years in, in, in Oklahoma. I mean, there was no, it was still all in Indian territory or U.S. Army territory. So really, you're talking. Uh, and, and of course, Custer, uh, a little bighorn, is 1876, right? Um, so, uh, 1870s is when the West is finally safe from Plains Indians, basically. I mean, it was Plains Indians that caused all the last. It's interesting, when you look at the, our country, the way it settled was it didn't settle. It wasn't this like push westward toward inevitably the manifest destiny going ever westward, ever westward. No, it went about to the plains, where the plains Indians stopped at cold, then leapfrogged over it to the San Francisco Gold Rush, settled California in the west, and then you had the middle, so the, the last, the end of the frontier, the last of it all was here. Not where you would have thought it might have been out toward the west. It was right here. The last of the front, the end of the frontier was, you know, was in Paladero Canyon. Kind of romantic. I always thought it was, I, when I walk around Paladero Canyon, I go, this was it. It was the end of the idea of limitlessness, and right here. All right, we've got, what time is it in somebody? Not quite. 20, uh, okay. All right, Dudley, what's your question? Tell us how the revolver changes the equation. Okay, the revolver. This is my single favorite discovery. The question is, that how, how did the revolver change the equation? This is my single favorite discovery. I mean, I wasn't the only, okay, other people knew about it, but I personally didn't know. But for me, it was this, my best story. And if I'm ever with, as I am sometimes with telling, you know, like middle schoolers or something, you know, history, you can really make them fall asleep. I tell the story I got. Okay, so, so here's the story. So, yeah, it is, this is a story. This is a story of uh, the invention of the six shooter. And it's really cool. It happens right here. Uh, and so here's the thing. So in the 1830s, uh, the... Uh, <coughs> The, uh, well, it started out with the, 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 the uh, well, let's start with the 1836. Let's start with the Texas Republic, okay? The Texas Republic wants to encourage people to come out, so they're going to give them head rights, which is like free land, right? And let, in, San, in San Antonio, okay? They're going to give them free land uh, to entice people to come, and they're going to give them, you know, nice big acreages out there. And the one requirement that you have is you've got to survey those head rights to take title to them which means you have to send a surveyor out to, let's say, imagine Bernie, Comfort, imagine places like that. You gotta go out there and you gotta survey it in order to, 
The Comanches fully understood that, that the uh, that the surveying instruments stole the land. This wasn't like some primitive kind of woo-woo, they stole the land. No, they actually steal the land. The surveying instruments steal the land. And so they just kill these surveyors in terrible ways. And the mortality rates in San Antonio in the 1830s were just off the charts. 10% of the population of the town, 15% a year. Okay? And they were dying in bad ways. And so it became, and so, uh, there became this, there was a premium put on the ability to keep survivors, or, sorry, surveyors alive. And as it turns out, there was one kid who came out as a surveyor, but he quickly realized he was better at protecting them. His name was John Coffey Hayes, Jack Hayes. Amazing guy. One of the greatest American military commanders ever. And Hayes was good at this. And uh, what he started to do is he started to, you know, organize men that they would go out and they would protect the surveyors. And... At some point, they got pretty good at it, and they, they didn't really have a name for these guys. The, the original was like, you know, they called them mounted gunmen, they called them spies. That was a name for a while. They were spies. And then but they finally settled on a name for these guys. The Rangers. They were the Rangers. And Jack Hayes got really good at fighting Comanches with his Rangers. He got really good at it. They were all crazy 23-year-old kids. I mean, they were, they were talking about the young guns. They didn't get paid. They didn't get anything. They were lucky if they got anything. They didn't care. They wanted to go out and fight Indians. And if they, they never would have worked if they, had, if they had families or the slightest concern for their own welfare. They went out and they fought in. These, these were like the Texans, right? The Texans. They go out there. They fight Comanches. And they get really good at it. The problem is there's this limitation. And we put it against the, the description I just gave you of the, the mounted Comanche ability to fire arrows. These guys have three shots. Kentucky long rifle, bang. Single shot pistol, bang. Single shot pistol, bang. And that's it. You cannot reload them from the back of a horse. Oh, and by the way, uh, Hayes had learned to copy Comanches. These guys were mounted because you couldn't fight Comanches. You couldn't fight them not on a horse. So these guys were all mounted. So, the problem is they, they, they solved the problem with just, and this was against you know, Comanches that could fire arrows at you like that. They solved it with sheer audacity, just charging and yelling and just being so brave and so astoundingly, uh, you know, uh, courageous and they, yeah, they crazy. crazy. Yeah, they were crazy. <laughs> that they, they did pretty well, but he never solved the problem. Okay, so, right. cut two. East Coast. There's this guy, a little guy named Sam Colt, and he has invented this little five-shot repeating pistol. And it's a cool thing. And it's like it's very cool. It's a, it's a light caliber, it's 36 caliber, but it's got these these cylinders. And so you can click them out and click them in. Bang, 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 right? Five shots. Click it out, click it in. Pretty cool. And he comes up with it and he tries to sell it to the American military, which you know, it was kind of a, a cavalry sidearm, but there was no cavalry in those years, which was a problem. So nobody wanted these little pistols, and, and nobody wanted them. And so, and so, uh, uh, so Colt goes bankrupt. He loses the plants. What year? Um, late late thirties, early forties. Around 1840, I had it said like, okay, the 30, around 1840. And he, it's over, it didn't work. It was a product that didn't work. He manufactured a certain noun, whatever. So, except somehow, the Texas Navy had ordered a couple of crates of them. Navy. <laughs> the Navy. Yeah. I don't know who they were going to fight. The Argentine Navy or the Louisiana Navy. I'm not sure who they were planning to fight, but there was, I, I joke, there was a Texas Navy. And they had an idea that, that a weapon like that would be a, a, like a first mate sidearm for, to enforce discipline on board. Not a bad idea. That was their idea. And so they got these crates came to Galveston where they sat. And nobody actually ever used them. And somehow Hayes found out about them in San Antonio. And he got a hold of them. And he immediately understood what they meant. They would even up the firepower advantages against Comanches. 
And they, these guys, and he and his men, they trained for a long time. I mean, they trained with these guns. They trained on horseback. They trained. He would gallop at full speed. They would shoot at posts. They would do. They would, you know, shoot. I mean, they would shoot from the side of the horse. All these things. They would. They practice with these guns. And in 1844, the Battle of Walker's Creek, they unleashed a new weapon against the Comanches. Mm. And they won, and it freaked the Comanches out because these guys had, because they had the five shots, right? Five, five shots. Five shots. Interchangeable cylinder, which you could do on the back of a horse. So now we got, well, Kentucky Long Rifle, which is obviously a better shot, but bang. And now I got 10 and 10. World changes. World changes completely. What happens next is that the Mexican War happens. And the U.S. Army hears about these crazy guys in Texas that go everywhere on horseback and can shoot these multiple, these revolving pistols. And, I mean, the Rangers freaked everybody out. Nobody ever seen anything like them. There weren't anything like them. And so they go, well, we want those. We want, we, what we want to do is we want to order a bunch of these guns to give to these crazy Texans to go fight the Mexicans in the Mexican War. And so the, but the problem was, it's a cult. Colt is bankrupt. Colt has lost all of his plans. Colt advertises in the New York papers for the patents, the plans, wow. the blueprints, because he doesn't have them anymore. He thinks somebody might have it, he doesn't know. Well, anyway, to link a long story short, he and Hayes' lieutenant Sam Walker end up designing together. If you can ever hold one in your hands as I have, it is, it is the Walker Colt. Oh my God. It is a five pound hand cannon. It is like this. And it is a 44. It is not a 36 caliber gun. Because Walker said, you know, you might want to go a little up the caliber, little Sam. So, anyway, Sam gets his friend, you know, Eli Whitney, to make them. And they make them. And the Rangers go to Mexico with mounted with these these things. These are, and, and by the way, they had one more bullet in the chamber, so they were six shooters. And they go to Mexico, and, and also these rangers were not, they, they gained incredible fame. One of the things they did was that after the Battle of Veracruz, there was this, all of these, or it was the Battle of Mexico City, I guess, Mexico City, the, the Mexican guerrillas immediately colonized, went back in the roads, they, they took over the roads, you know, just guerrillas. They just sent Hayes and his men out, and they just cleaned them out. And to the, and, and to the point where, and they were not gentle, shall we say. There was a moment when they were riding through a town uh, where these girls were operating out of, and I think somebody took a shot at a ranger. A ranger just executed, basically killed them all. I mean, I think 85 people or something. But anyway, they were, they were famously tough, and they used these guns. And, and of course, the rest of history, well, Sam Colt becomes one of the richest men in America. Uh, the six-shooter kills more people than the Roman short sword and defines the American West. And this, I will conclude with this, that it was said, uh, broadly speaking, that before Jack Hayes came into the West, everybody came into the West on foot carrying a Kentucky long rifle. And after Jack Hayes, everybody came in on a horseback carrying a six-shooter. <laughs> with that, I rest my case. <laughs>